Well, I, I guess I've I've been a professor uh, twenty six years now, mm -hmm. uh, coming to the end of it all, I guess. But uh, in any case, uh, I trained as a scientist, not as a clinician. Right. And uh, oh, maybe twenty five years ago, I would uh, attend different orthopedic and neurology meetings, and the and the docs mm -hmm. would say, "Would you please see a patient uh, for us?" And I said, I would say, no, I, I, I can't because uh, I'm not a clinician. But they would say, well, we'll, we'll come to the consult with you and, and show us what your eyes see. Um, and uh, I did and uh, soon realized that with my training and my background, I would see things that they didn't in terms of uh, uh, causation pathways, uh, some ill advice that they were uh, prescribing that was going against what our science was showing right. as, as being appropriate for both taking pain away and, and creating other issues. So that's how it all started. And then, uh, you know, I was asked to see uh, some high profile athletes, and, and that turned into consulting for Olympic programs and professional teams so now I think I've seen folks from just about every sport on this planet Well, if uh, one of your listeners has been told they have non-specific low back pain or they've read a study about non-specific back pain, my view is there's no such thing. It just means they have not had an assessment. Right. If that uh, patient or individual has uh, undergone a thorough assessment that has involved provocative testing, which involves uh, finding motions, postures, and loads that cause the pain and make it worse, you've identified uh, a good part of the cause. Right. And now that gives you a very solid clue as to how to proceed with the treatment. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, th so the causes of back pain uh, I wish I had a simple answer for that, um, but I'm not going to default and say we don't know. In fact, I would take the opposite view and say we know precisely what causes back pain mm -hmm. if we can look at the individual. So if we saw, just to take an example of someone with a disc bulge, posterior lateral on the left-hand side with a focal distribution. Now that sounds like a bunch of mumbo-jumbo, yeah. but... <laughs> but we've 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 created enough of those to know that that person was flexing forward and bending to the right repetitively mm -hmm. over and over again and we also know a lot about the shape of their discs which uh, there's quite a variety in 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 the population as well so mm -hmm. again if if someone comes in with a very specific type of pain and we can replicate that we we can get at what the cause is quite uh, precisely but generally it's people who have repetitive movement patterns that are non-optimal for their body and their injury history yeah. um, what they do for, if, if they're training and working out what they do for the other 23 hours very much should determine the components of their exercise program and whether it's appropriate or inappropriate so it, it really is the full gamut and uh, j just to let your, your listenership know, Chris, when I see a patient, it takes me about three hours to perform a thorough assessment mm -hmm. and come up with advice on what they should not do and what they should do. No, you're, you're, you're exactly right, Chris. If you yeah. take an orange seed and you squeeze it between your thumb and your finger, yeah. you, can di you, can, you can direct that orange seed to squirt out the left side of your pinch grip or the right side. It depends on how you bias the force. So right. it's, hy it's hydraulically driven. Okay. So, the, so the nucleus of the disc, which is a gel, if you keep flexing forward, it pushes and squeezes that, that hydraulic fluid, if you want to consider it such. Yeah. Uh, it's going to... Uh, through hydraulic stresses of bending forward, push it out the back. Yeah. And then the collagen, which makes up the rings of the annulus, it will 
destruct and delaminate at the site of highest stress. I mean, that makes perfect sense. So you can then reconstruct what the stresses were looking at the nature of the uh, damage. Now, in order to get to that level, you would have to have a medical image like an MR or a CT. But without that, certainly you could replicate those, those postures and movements. And uh, you've seen my assessment DVD on some of the mechanical-based uh, assessment exercises very specifically probing different postures and loads to really isolate what 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 that specific damage is causing in terms of specific pain yeah so I guess a sort of a very simple solution for for maybe just general people who you know who experience their back pain an easy I guess an easy way for them to um, not so much overcome it but at least sort of ease it or reduce it is to maybe identify the postures that they're creating pain in and sort of come out of those postures and stay in sort of a, what would I, I would call like a neutral posture. Would that make well, sense? Well, it, 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 it might be a neutral posture. It may not be. But let's, mm -hmm. if we replace that term with the resilient posture. Right, I see. Now, that, that resilient posture, that might change. Mm -hmm. And it will change throughout the day. And it changes depending on the loading history for the day. Yep. Uh, for example, if, if I asked you to get up in the morning, touch your toes, and then go out kayaking in a, in a canoe, mm -hmm. I suspect that your resilience to that would depend on if you did something else first. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, right, okay. it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's simple, but it's complicated. If you have a sudden onset from bending down and picking up a pencil or sneezing yeah. or uh, something like that where the loading wasn't very high, this is discogenic back pain, pain from the disc. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the characteristic of the disc that uh, it usually succumbs to cumulative trauma. In other words, someone is repetitively loading themselves in a way that at the time, they might not recognize it as, as bad because the disc really has no mechanism for sensing the cumulative trauma. Mm -hmm. But they continue with the flawed movement, building up this cumulative trauma, which when you examine it, it, examine it is actually delamination of the collagen of the disc. The nucleus is working its way through these delaminations, and then this, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, which happens to be... Uh, picking up a pencil, for example, they flex a bit too much or they bend a bit too much one way, creating that last little hydraulic force to get the nucleus just to come uh, to the surface. And if it touches off a nerve, uh, either through direct mechanical uh, contact, you will get that very acute episode you're talking about. Yeah. Or... It's also the nature of the nucleus as it, come out, as it comes out to set off a very uh, reactive inflammatory process. So the person stays locked up for three days and, and in about a week they're, they're, they're coming out of it. And they're, they're, they may actually become quite fine again, sure. not realizing that that collagen delamination remains. Uh, the, the curious thing is the disc doesn't heal like other tissues mm -hmm. and they have now set themselves up for a repeat occurrence and it's very typical of that type of patient to have a couple of nasty episodes a year and yet they're not too bad for the for the other times well it's it's the uh, incorrect movement pattern combined with the load mm -hmm. that uh, creates this cumulative delamination process. See, it, it's, it's quite unfair in a way. You know, we all know these couch potatoes who can sit in front of the television day after day, overweight and whatnot, and they don't get back pain from sitting. And yet here you have your clients who are dedicating an hour a day working with you, and yet they get back pain sitting in front of the computer for an hour. And, yeah. and the reason is they've accumulated this, this cumulative delamination
lamination in their disc, so sitting now becomes painful. So it's rather unfair that the fitter people yeah. Yeah. <laughs> will, will actually uh, become less tolerable to certain uh, things. So mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to select the exercises appropriately for those people. We have to start with a definition here of flexion. Uh, there's flexion movement, and, and people n n know what I mean by that. In that, when you flex or bend your spine forward, that's flexion movement. Right. The other kind of flexion is flexion moment, which is the effort of trying to flex, but you do not move the spine, uh, right. if you can imagine that. So. Yeah. Uh, flexion moment is very different from flexion movement. Yep. So let's talk about flexion movement. Yeah. Uh, as if someone was flexing their spine doing a sit-up. Well, here it all gets down uh, yet again to uh, how people are putting exercise programs together. Let's take a, a, a yoga practitioner who mm -hmm. does all kinds of bending exercises. Um, they will get away with that. Uh, if they haven't uh, created these delaminations in the, in their in the collagen of their uh, disc, um, and if they haven't lifted heavy, so my point is, if you lift heavy and do spine flexion movement, as in lots of sit-ups, those two are counter-opposed. That's a poor choice of exercise combination. Right. So if all you're going to do is yoga without much load and, and a few sit-ups and that kind of thing, you might get away with it. But now if you're going to throw in weight training and starting to lift heavy, uh, you can't do sit-ups and yoga and all of these heavy bending exercises. So you've got to pick one. Yeah. Um, if, if you're going to lift, you need the opposite now of what yoga gives you, and that's stiffness in the core, stiffness in the spine. Mm -hmm. So learning to uh, move and flex through the hips, locking the back is, is what people will notice Olympic weightlifters do, for example, and it's the only way that they can survive. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Do you mind just talking a little bit about that uh, that flexion moment that you described? Yes. Well, now let's take a push-up position. Mm -hmm. And if you just hold that position, you're you're working the abdominals. So that is a flexion moment exercise because it's challenging the abdominals, but you're not flexing with motion into it. Yeah. So the spine now is quite resilient against the delamination injury process, the cumulative trauma process I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Let's let's take a progression there. So we could have let's let's replace sit-ups. Yeah. And uh, if a person was to then start with a push-up posture, just hold it, and then they could put their elbows on a gym ball, clasp their hands together, mm -hmm. and have the feet apart on the ground, and now they can do what we call the stir-the-pot exercise, which would be the next level in the progression, which is a terrific abdominal moment exercise mm -hmm. uh, in that you're really challenging the abdominals. Now, some people have misquoted me, and they said, oh, McGill's against flexion. But it's it's kind of a junior view of what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, I never said don't do flexion moment work. And then you know I'll I'll read this tripe on the internet. Oh, I, we listened to Miguel and we got so weak that uh, you know we we lost our our ability uh, in in the abdominals. And I said, well, that, that that's just it's just ignorance. That they, they don't know the difference between flexion and flexion moment. So right. we continue that now with with stir the pot exercise. And by the way, if you do that, your sit-up score will, will go even higher. Mm -hmm. So you don't train sit-ups and you become even more athletic and avoid the injury mechanism, which is, mm -hmm. which is just uh, uh, terrific. But uh, in any case, we can devise all kinds of abdominal progressions uh, based on the moment challenge, not the movement challenge. before if you may understand I, that. may I yeah may, can I expand on it a little bit more Chris yeah sure of course you can 
Yeah, well, there was a nice study done in the U.S. military. Now, you know in the U.S., the soldiers and sailors have to pass a fitness test every year, mm -hmm. and one of the tests is speed sit-ups. Now, thank goodness they're, they're, they're changing this because it's a huge source of back injury in the military. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, in order to justify the change, there was a study that uh, was done down in Texas where they just had people do planks and stir the pot and exercises like that and don't train the sit-up. And guess what happened? Their mm. sit-up scores went up. So they had healthier backs and then a stronger core. Yeah. Um, I can give you examples with, uh, I mean, as you, you'll probably know from the DVDs, I, I do a number of consults with these terrific, uh, you know, the UFC uh, athletes and, and the MMA fighters and whatnot. Yeah. Now, they're, they're a special breed because, first and foremost, you need a very developed abdominal wall to survive. In other words, it's armor. Mm -hmm. So you build the abdominal wall that pr pr protects your visceral organs against uh, the kicks and punches that would otherwise rip you apart inside. Mm -hmm. So traditionally in martial arts, they've been doing, you know, a thousand sit-ups a day. A yeah. lot of them become flexion intolerant. They build up so much trauma in their discs that they can't train anymore. Not mm -hmm. because of the damage in a fight, but because of the, the, the crazy way of, the, of, the, of them training. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've taken out all of the flexion movement. And these, the MMA people are interesting because they practice a, a form called jujitsu, which requires a lot of spine flexion movement to bring the thighs and the hips right up over in front of their, their face to execute some of the submission holds, for example. Yeah. Well, there have been some real top-level UFC fighters who have become flexion uh, uh, injured, they can't train that way. And yet, if you go to the top trainers, and I'm not talking about people who have opinions on the internet, I'm talking about people who create top level fighters. Mm -hmm. They will tell you that in, in adopting our approaches, uh, taking out some of the flexion movement under load exercises uh, uh, returns the resilience uh, in, in their fighters and they have to save the real flexion uh, motion for the octagon or for the ring and that's how they mm -hmm. uh, salvage their careers. Right. And uh, you know, I, I, again, it, it irritates me a little bit when I read these people chatting away on the internet that, oh, you've got to have a lot of uh, flexion-based, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm talking flexion movement in programs because people do that in real life. Well, then I, 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 I ask them, really, how many backs have you salvaged and how many of those people were in the last Olympics? Because sure. I'll, I'll compare my numbers with anybody on that one. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, wow. you, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of mythology, and, a, and I don't think they've done their homework in mm -hmm. understanding this, this cumulative trauma sure. Uh, scenario. Sure. So just to sort of, I, I get, I maybe summarize in, in my head, and hopefully for some of the listeners as well, um, you were talking about they, they train without the spinal flexion, uh, before the event, so they're able to be stronger in the event. So they're so they're in a sense they're able to use spinal flexion. So exactly, they so built. They put money in the bank. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's as if they're building a foundation underneath spinal flexion, so it's allowed in a in a way to kind of happen. Does that does that sort of summarize it? Well worded, sir. Okay, uh, I, that, that, those are fairly simple answers. Mm -hmm. uh, a neutral spine is the curvature in your low back that is uh, what is there when you're standing. Mm -hmm. So some people stand with quite a, a large curve in their low back. Some people will stand with a flat back. But if we were to measure it scientifically, we go for the principle call principle called elastic equilibrium. In other words, that's the position of the spinal joints where they are most relaxed. So if you move out of that position, you put them into bending stress. So that, that's neutral, uh, but it, there's quite a lot of bi biological variability in that. Mm -hmm. But if I can just finish that notion off, 
don't look at great athletes and say, oh, well, the, the, they're, they're in neutral or out of. For example, every great sprinter in the world has a lot of lordosis. Mm -hmm. You have to have it because the power production out of the hips uh, obviously is created through the stride during the sprinting. Yeah. So if they can turn their pelvis, tip it forward, more lordosis means they get more power throughout the whole stride with their feet on the ground. But you will never find a UFC fighter with a lot of lordosis who can kick you in the head. They have to have flat backs because they now have to turn the pelvis, rotate it posteriorly so that the flexion power out of the hip can now allow their leg to come up and kick an opponent in the head. So do you see how, again, it's very functionally yeah. culier? to a very specific type of athleticism. Sure. Yeah. So how you would train one back is quite different from how you would train another mm -hmm. and define their neutral spine. Mm -hmm. So when you ask me how vigilant do people need to be in maintaining it, you see my answer? It depends on the person. Sure. Absolutely. So it's as if you're, well, it's, it's like you described earlier, it's sort of looking at the mechanics of someone and looking at the mechanics of, let's say, their event that they're in and acting accordingly, I guess. Um, yeah. Who, who, why are they training? Yeah. What, what, what is their injury history? Mm -hmm. What, what, and, and, you know, we can take the lazy man's approach here and say, what exercise or training approach will get us to the goal mm -hmm. in the easiest way? Sure. Now, I wish more people would ask that simple question mm -hmm. because it would help their programming uh, a lot more. And then they would decide on uh, whether they're training a gymnast mm -hmm. who uh, obviously needs a lot of spine mobility to do a floor tumbling routine. Mm -hmm. But yeah. don't ask that gymnast to put 100 kilo over their head in a, in a, with a, you know, a clean and jerk or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> those, are, those are two counter-opposed uh, objectives. The, 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 you would have to have a very, very special spine to survive those. Yeah. Ken, I, I love your progressions and the way, you, what way you, you follow this through, Chris, but can I just go back one step and, and say what a progression should be and then I'll get to endurance? Yeah, sure. No problem. Yeah. First and foremost, remove the cause. So here, here's the failure of a lot of trainers and physical therapists and docs. A person comes in with back pain and they'll tell them, oh, here, do these exercises. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, wait a second, they've got back pain. Mm -hmm. Everything you give them is going to hurt them. First and foremost, remove the cause. So there are some people that come in and I say, hey, we're not, I'm not going to give you any exercises. Uh, here's what you have to do to remove the cause. It might be a lifestyle change. It might be the way that they're doing something. It might be their posture or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's absolutely critical. Then we work with corrective and therapeutic exercises carefully selected to groove in a movement pattern that doesn't provoke pain and spares the, the, the tissues that are yelping a little bit. Right. Then we, uh, of course, build stability where it's needed, build mobility where it's needed, and then we build endurance, not strength. Mm -hmm. Strength comes later. And there's a great confusion, I think, in many people as to what, oh, I'm going strength training. Well, not in my view. If they're lifting a few weights and whatnot, that, that might be strength training. It might be endurance training. It's all a matter of the programming. But real strength training is maximal stimulation of all the motor units in a muscle. I mean, it's pretty brutal, real strength training. Yeah. So that's what I'm, I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. So we have to... But people get hurt when they break form. So you can imagine if, if a person could do three perfect lifts, mm -hmm. their chance of becoming injured would be quite slim. But if they broke form on the fourth lift, you can see how that's the one that they get hurt with. And you can follow people's injury history. They get hurt when they break form. So my point is endurance has to be matched to their strength. So that they don't break form. So if you just make someone stronger mm -hmm. and they're not endurable, they'll use all that wonderful newfound strength to break themselves and hurt themselves even more. 
sure. because they didn't have the endurance and the discipline to to keep form. So that's that's the trick of endurance. Yeah, build a a foundation of sufficient discipline mm-hmm. endurance yep. so that they don't don't break form. Now that that that's that. Endurance is very different mm-hmm. uh, depending on the person, their history, and, and what their goals are. But generally speaking, if we're ta- just talking general programming now, we'll, we'll use what we call the Russian descending pyramid yeah. for uh, building endurance, which is quite counter to the bodybuilding physiological type of endurance, mm-hmm. um, which is, say people are, are doing 10 repetitions, they want to make it an endurance exercise, so they do two more, squeeze out two more. So get nice and tired and squeeze out two more and go to failure. That's endurance training. Yeah. Well, in fact, it isn't. By mm-hmm. going to failure, you just ruined your athleticism. You just taught your body to get very fatigued, now practice a fatigued pattern. In contrast to that, the Russians and Eastern Europeans are a lot more clever, I think, in, in building endurance. The descending pyramid is this. They will do uh, a few repetitions, but not to the point where they get fatigued and they break form. Mm-hmm. So say, uh, pick an exercise. Like, like, let's just do a floor exercise like a bird dog. Do, do you know what I'm, I mean? Or a quadruped? Quadruped, yeah. Yeah, so do it. Do a 10-second contraction. Uh, with with, with uh, a bird dog, sweep the floor. Do do five of those on one side. Do five on the other. Then rest. Mm-hmm. Now the next set is a descending set. So now you only do four bird dogs on the right, four on the left, and then rest, and then three and three. So this way of building endurance for a back pain patient. They're only doing ten second holds, so they're guaranteeing that they're not going to go into a muscular cramp or pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the descending pyramid, as they build fatigue, and uh, they don't break form. So you see, it's kind of a clever way of yeah. of building endurance, never breaking the patient into pain and, and bad form. So yeah. anyway, there there's the start of it. But of course, they're not going to the Olympics based on the descending pyramid. But mm-hmm. that is your foundation base, and yeah. then you program the much longer durations, and you can start moving into the physiological aspects of fatigue. Yeah, yeah, because I think that's what I find from a lot of people is they um, they go straight into that that sort of strength, well, sort of the common held uh, notion of what strength training is, that three, four sets of 12, 10, or whatever it might be, you feel that burn, and then move on. They don't build that, that foundation, which will make them so much stronger when they do jump up into that into that sort of level of training. Yeah, no, folks won't like this, but it depends on the person once again. Yeah. Um, we can't even begin to answer that until you put a person in front of us. We assess their current level of fitness, mm-hmm. what their pain mechanisms are, and what their goals are. But if we knew that, well, of course, we could come up with a very tightly prescribed uh, program. But generally speaking, mm-hmm. there are some generalizations here, Chris, that I, I, I think yeah. we could establish. Yeah, One is uh, walking. Do a corrected walking program. Now, it's not really in the gym, but they should be doing this two or three times a day because it's the only... See, in the gym, you can take uh, all of the lifts, uh, you know, just take some some staple ones like a a power clean, a bench press, a squat. Those are all done with two feet on the floor. And, And yet, when I measure a lot of strong men and women, the first deficit that pops out in their back is the ability to stand on one leg while carrying load. Well, you can imagine a rugby player. They're mm-hmm. running down the field. They plant one leg, and they have to, they have to cut, change direction quickly. Yep. Well, if they plant the left leg and the, ri- and, the, and the right foot is swinging through the air, changing direction, do you see how the pelvis wants to drop on the right-hand side? So yeah. it's a lateral core strength mm. that, that allows them to be slow, Mm-hmm. And it allows them to hurt their back. Mm-hmm. So in that particular case, that all goes right back to walking. So you yep. begin a walking program, mm-hmm. and then it, it trans to build that in the gym. Now start off with a what's called a suitcase carry, yep. carrying load just in one hand, not a farmer's walk. 
a right. suitcase carry, yep. uh, then they can carry that weight at the chin. And then you've seen on the DVDs doing a bottoms up kettlebell carry and whatnot, which really is a very nice progression for that type of a program. Yeah. So for that kind of person, that that's a very wise exercise progression. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I, I think just about everyone should do what we call the big three exercises yeah. um, for, for, for their core. Uh, not only does it help them to be injury resilient, it helps them to perform better too. It makes them stronger and faster. Mm-hmm. And that is the, uh, the bird dog, the side bridge, and uh, whatever form of uh, that, that modified curl up, which is not much curling up at all really. Sure. Um, or they can replace that with stir the pot or whatever. But those three exercises are the foundation. Yeah. And we have uh, entire uh, top flight sports clubs around the world who <laughs> begin every training session with those exercises and, uh, and, and then go on to their uh, particular programs uh, from there on in. But it's all about stiffening the core and freeing the hips and shoulders. Well, genera- the tough, really tough questions. Uh, I'll, I can tell you what it isn't, first of all. Mm-hmm. Uh, people think core, core exercises uh, have to do with the muscle called transverse abdominis and whatnot. Mm-hmm. This is absolutely barking up the wrong tree. Right. Uh, forget about that muscle. Uh, if you're focusing on it, you're, you're, you're wasting your time. Um, the, the, let me talk about what it does do. Let's take the core as the region between the two ball and socket joints, the ball and sockets of the shoulders and the ball and sockets of the hips. Now, the ball and socket joints, the hips and the shoulders, are made to create power. Mm -hmm. Lots of force through a great range of motion. That's what they're designed to do. So the muscles of the ball and socket joints are designed to move. Now, the region between those two, the spine, is... The polar opposite. The muscles are designed to stop motion. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they should be trained differently. Now, the region between those two ball and socket joints are made up of joints that form a bending beam. Now, if you take a coat hanger and you want to bend that coat hanger back and forth, you're you're obliged to. Mm -hmm. But it will eventually crack somewhere. And if you keep creating the stress-strain reversals in that coat hanger, it's eventually going to break. And that's what people do to their spines. Because it's not a ball and socket joint, it's a bending beam. So if you keep bending it, eventually you will succumb. So, the the core muscles stop motion. Now imagine this. If you were to kick a a football, a soccer ball, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming a good English lad is very proficient at that. Now, Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so think of the muscles you use to kick with, and people are going to say, well, we need to flex the hip. Mm-hmm. All right, let's take rectus femoris, psoas, iliacus, all those muscles that span the hip, that propel the thigh forward for the kick. Now, those muscles, when they pull on your thigh bone on the femur, they create motion, but mm-hmm. they also pull on the other end of those muscles into the core, which is onto the pelvis and the spine. Now, if the spine bends, that means less motion is going to go into the leg on the other side. So, if you can imagine this, if you have more proximal stiffness, in other words, no motion between the shoulders and the hips. So, all of those muscles that cross the shoulders and the hips, the movement only takes place on the distal side. So, The core is all about creating proximal stiffness to enhance distal mobility. So if you want to kick a soccer ball, stiffen the core supremely at that instant that your that your boot hits the the ball and then all the athleticism is expressed on the distal side and you get a beautiful kick. But if you have a soft belly and a soft core and your spine bends, that's called an energy leak. 
uh, you, you won't kick the ball very far at all. So imagine a tennis serve. Every everyone in your listenership will know, say, say, say Venus Williams. Yep. So when she serves a tennis ball at the instant and just before the tennis racket hits the ball, you're going to hear that grunt, the whoo. <laughs> And what she's doing there is overdriving the stiffness in her core, which allows even more power and speed on the distal side of her ball and socket joint, which is her shoulders. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're creating what's called a super stiffness down through the core to, to become even more athletic on the distal side. So that's the function of the core for athletic performance. Mm -hmm. Violating that will lead to poor performance and injury. People think, well, if it's not transverse abdominis, what is it? Do you want me to answer that? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. So it's it's funny when people talk about their core, they think about their deep obliques and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Again, it, it, it's a bit m misperceived because all of what I mentioned there about stiffening this bending beam, mm -hmm. one of the best core muscles is, is one called quadratus lumborum, which runs from the rib cage down to the pelvis mm -hmm. and attaches the entire lumbar spine through the transverse processes. Latissimus dorsi is a fantastic core muscle. It helps you lift, it, 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 it stiffens, uh, it, it creates more athleticism distally through the shoulder. Uh, um, the whole erector spinae complex, the gluteal muscles have to be considered part of the core because uh, they are the ones that are part and parcel of expressing this, this magnificent power development out of the core through into the, uh, the distal femur. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and as you know, you'll hear commentary on, on television time and time again, the great ones use their hips, yeah. the poor ones use their spines or their shoulders or their knees. Mm -hmm. And uh, a good pair of hips backed up by a stiff core yeah. beat everything else. You can look at, you know, virtually every MMA technique is all about pitting the winner's hips against the loser's any other body part you like. Well, again, it depends on many factors, but uh, my first question would be, well, what does the person do for the other 23 hours a day when they're not training? Mm -hmm. if, if they are sitting at a desk, uh, they've got all the flexion they need. Sure. <laughs> you, you don't need any more. Um, watch them tie their shoes. Are they proficient? Mm -hmm. uh, if, they're, if they're moving well without any load and deflection, let it be. I, I, I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. But don't tell me that you're going to take the spine through the range of motion under load sure. to create that athleticism. Yeah. And again, these are people who, if, if they've got uh, 30 folks around the world in the Olympics uh, mm -hmm. in, in London this, this uh, summer, great. I'll yeah. listen to them. Sure. sure. So I, <laughs> but, I, I, uh, I mean, I gave you that jujitsu example as mm -hmm. well. Uh, you know, go go talk to the top. Uh, well, I've I've uh, I I know a lot of them, and I've uh, they've come back and they said thank you. We we've salvaged another career. Sure, sure. Uh, by avoiding loaded spine through 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 the flexion range, sure. and uh, that person then uh, reduced their pain, and they were able to train once again to to world class level. Mm -hmm. But if you think you're going to train through that kind of pain. Taking your spine out of neutral with heavy load, I, I, I think, uh, well, I, I, I can't imagine that you're having success. Sure. And I think, um, again, if you want to add to this as well, um, I see a lot of people walking around, um, the exercise, the wood chop, they, they'll, they'll go from this high position to a low position, but they'll use their, they'll basically, they'll, they'll use their spine. Is that the sort of thing that you're getting at? If someone is doing that exercise, so the twisting exercise, and they're using their spine or their obliques or their core muscles or whatever they want to call them to initiate that that pull or that twist, that's where the weakness is coming from. They need to twist from the hips and lock the lock the 
the ribs and the shoulders down to the hips. Would that make sense? I, yeah, th this is exactly what we're talking about. So it's not the problem with the exercise. It's a problem with how the exercise is performed. So if yeah. you're sloppy and allowing the rib cage to leave the pelvis yeah. and you create rotational power through the core, eventually most people, not maybe not all, but most people, they're going to uh, damage their spine. Mm -hmm. um, so the wood chop exercise, I mean, it's a wonderful exercise yeah. if the motion is through the ball and socket joints, which are the hips, mm -hmm. pivoting around the feet and, and around the shoulders. But, you know, you can extend that principle to the landmine exercise side to side. Fantastic for torsional power, yeah. but you can't take the torsional movement through the spine it's got to be through the hips mm -hmm. uh, and the shoulders but I mean I can tell you a funny story about that there was these guys who, who came to see me and they brought a slosh pipe which is uh, y y you know a, a, a large plastic plumbing pipe oh, right, uh, yeah. half filled with water mm -hmm. and they were putting it on their shoulders kind of in a as if they were racking an Olympic bar and then they were twisting from side to side trying to spin the water out to the ends of the slosh pipe and they said isn't this a great torsional exercise I said no it isn't it's stupid you're gonna hurt your back and they called me not very nice names no, I don't know what I'm talking about. This is great. They've developed some UFC, or not UFC level, but some, some martial arts and whatnot. Well, I saw one of them a year later right. in an exercise meeting. Mm -hmm. He could hardly walk. He'd hurt his back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. It's a shame. Well, you know, I, 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 I hate to see people hurt, but, yeah. uh, you know, I, I remembered what he called me before, so I... Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah. I did. Ha I did allow myself a little undisciplined smile. But can you just describe, maybe in a little bit more detail? Obviously, not too much detail, but just a little bit more detail about hollowing and bracing. Yeah, hollowing was uh, this uh, term that came from Australia, and uh, the theory was that people with back pain have a delayed onset of a, of a core muscle called transverse abdominis. Mm -hmm. So the way to isolate the muscle to train it was to think about drawing in your navel towards your spine. Mm -hmm. Well. The, the, there's there's a lot of problems with that, and first of all, not all back pa back pain patients have have this perturbed muscle, and in fact, it turns out very few do. So it, it's 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 not worthy of following up for that particular reason with uh, in a discussion of training. Yeah. But then this thing took on a life of its 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 own. This concept, I was uh, working with different Olympic squads from different countries and I heard the coach say, you know, come on lads, draw in your abdominal wall and then we're going to go and lift or draw before you start to run or it was just so bastardized as right. as a concept yeah. and and that that wasn't it at all you the the core is is based on a system of guy wires all of the muscles around the spine and core stiffen uh, if we were talking about abdominally stiffing, I, I'm just talking about pretend you're going to be, you know, whacked in the belly, and you would uh, you you would you would perform that stiffening maneuver. So there's a brace, mm -hmm. but the trick then is to tune the stiffening or the bracing to the task. And uh, y you know, when you look at a, an Olympic lifter, for example, they inhale uh, air to about seventy percent of maximum lung volume, somewhere in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. and then they compress, they depress, and pull their shoulders and rib cage down to their pelvis, almost putting on a synthetic compression suit, if you want to think of it that way. Yeah. So there, there, there's a high level of bracing for an Olympic lift. Versus, we might be talking one of your clients who gets out of a chair and experiences back pain in the sit-to-stand maneuver. Mm -hmm. So there the trick would be lift the rib cage up just a little bit, stiffen the core mildly, maybe a 5% contraction, mm -hmm. lean forward through the hips, transferring the weight onto the feet, and stand up by pulling the hips through. Mm -hmm. Then let the brace go. 
Sure. So do you see uh, bracing? I mean, I, I read these criticisms. Oh, McGill just squeezes the hell out of everybody with bracing. And, and again, mm. they don't understand the work. Yeah. It's all about tuning that stiffness yeah. and controlling uh, positions yeah. so that uh, the tissues that are pain-producing um, are, are buttressed. Yeah. So it's as if it... If it's as if it's like a pulse, so it's done at the start of the movement, so as you're about to initiate the, the lift or the stand from the seat to standard position, it's as if you're just sort of using that 5% just to initiate a pulse, and then it, as you stand, it begins to relax itself. Would that make sense? You know, if, if we were training uh, your mom, for example, to get out of the chair, I would hold on 5% and just teach that stiffness. Yeah, all and the way through. All the way through. Yeah. But when we get into pulsing, now we're talking about power production. Right. So if you were kicking, punching, throwing, something like that, or hitting a golf ball. You used that example earlier. That very much is a pulse. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've, I've measured uh, the, the woman who's hit a golf ball. <laughs> she won the world long drive championship. and I, I've measured uh, uh, her male counterpart in uh, men's golf. And I, I've measured some pretty good golfers. And what they do is, uh, you know, you won't find a great, big, strong rugby player who can hit a golf ball very far. And the reason is they're too strong too stiff and they don't pulse mm -hmm. whereas the golfers are quite compliant they don't have much stiffness nor do they use much strength as they're winding out of the back swing swing the club down to hit the ball but at that instant of ball contact they absolutely do pulse you yeah. can measure it through the, uh, the, the that's why they wear spikes to spike into the ground transmit that pulse up through the external rotators of the of the trailing hip so they're driving it with glutes glute medius and then they let the pulse go after the ball has left the club for a faster uh, follow through so do you see how that that's a pulse power production sure sure Dif yeah. diff different than getting out of a chair Yeah, well, it, it usually invokes a smile from people because it's not what a lot of people initially think. <laughs> right. But <laughs> anyway, the, yeah, I, I, the, the last chapter of my Ultimate Back Fitness book, I was going to write a book about super stiffness, and then uh, I, I ran out of energy, and I just added it as a chapter in, in the last edition. Mm -hmm. But there, there's eight principles, and it's all about enhancing performance and increasing your injury resilience by a appropriately activating your core muscles. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a little bit about speed and hitting a golf club and creating the pulse. Yeah. Uh, hitting a golf ball, pardon me. So th that would be the pulsing part it is, is one component. Yeah. Um, you can imagine uh, if you were to stiffen your body in certain uh, if you were to take a handshake, for example, you could handshake with with a with a colleague, but if you stiffened your core and then stiffened your fist on the left hand side while you were shaking hands with the right hand side, you'd find a a larger hand grip. Mm -hmm. And there there's many scientific reasons you're tightening the fascia, um, but you're also creating um, a neural response. Your body has. Uh, uh, facilitators and inhibitors in the neural system. Mm -hmm. So when you squeeze hard with your left hand, it's a cross inhibition in that you're inhibiting the inhibitors, which allows more strength to the, be expressed on the opposite side of the body. So there are some clever physios who use this, for example, mm -hmm. in people who have neurological damage uh, or, or just a loss of strength with, with age or inactivity. And uh, they're, they're really manipulating the, uh, the, the inhibitors through the uh, neural system. Anyway, that's another component of sure. uh, super stiffness. Mm -hmm. Another one might be uh, some of your listeners who train will be very familiar with sticking points. Super stiffness allows you to get through sticking points. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, if I could just use a bench press as an example, um, you, you, you lower the weight to uh, the bar touches your chest, you initiate the, the pulling off your chest or pushing off your chest primarily with the pecs and the anterior deltoid muscle. Mm -hmm. Then as you shift strategies onto the, the triceps, that's usually the sticking point. Mm -hmm. Well, if you could then stiffen your core and just as you're approaching the stiffening point, you grab the bar and bend it, yeah. externally rotating. There is using your latissimus dorsi now mm -hmm. as a very effective eliminator of the sticking point in bench press. And again, the Russians, the Eastern Europeans, it, I, I, if I was doing an interview there, they go, yeah, well, of course, we know that. But sure. in, in the North American culture mm -hmm. and the Western European culture of strength, that's, that's news to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, it's mostly just sort of get the weight and push it up and bring it back down again. And, uh, yeah, you, you know, it, it's funny. I asked a group of my students the other day, I said, do you folks know how to do bench press? And they just looked at me and they said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I thought, oh, how naive, because it takes me about an hour to coach the nuances of bench press where they can, you know, add another 10 or 20 percent to their lift immediately after the hour. But they thought they knew, they thought laying, bench press was laying on your back and lowering weight to your chest and pushing it back up again. Yeah, there, um, you know, we go back to the old days of uh, Olympic lifting and, and remember there, there used to be a military press and, and uh, th those, when you looked at the, the old Olympians in those events, they were very different men and women than what we see now. Mm -hmm. Whereas Olympic lifting these days is building the elastic strong man and the elastic strong woman. Mm -hmm. um, because of the supreme speed that's required uh, to compete in those events. So, it, but if, let's just take a very simple example. You know, throwing a baseball is uh, one example. And, and when, you, when you work with some of these people who, they're not very tall. Say they might be 5'10 or 5'11 tall. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can throw a, a baseball a, a well over 100 miles an hour. And you look at them and you say, well, you don't look like a, a very strong person. Yeah. How can you throw a ball well over 100 miles an hour? And you realize that they're elastic athletes. So the, mm -hmm. the first thing you'll see is their hips turn. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a core hip elasticity. Yeah. They start with their, with their throwing hand and their gloved hand together. And as the hips turn, they open up their chest. So now you see there's an, a second elastic going across peck to peck side to side, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And then the third spring is that beautiful elastic athleticism they have from their elbow down to their fingertips. Mm -hmm. So when you put those three elastics together, perfectly time them with, with not a lot of strength, but with perfectly timed strength pulses, you can throw 100 miles an hour. Nice. So you see you're creating the elastic athlete. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, um, when I uh, watch people train for, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, dunking a basketball, let's say, mm -hmm. um, or high jump. And then uh, I'll see these high jumpers warming up by uh, stretching out their hamstrings and whatnot. And I'll say, what are you thinking? Mm -hmm. Why are you stretching your hamstrings? Hamstrings, uh, I mean, when you look at the great and measure some of the great leapers in the NBA, they have tight hamstrings. Mm -hmm. they, those are the elastics that they load and then bounce off and potentiate with an extra pulse of muscle. Yeah. Uh, it's the same with, you know, you look at some of the great dominant uh, long-distance runners. Mm -hmm. Well, truth be known, they're kangaroos in that they uh, don't have huge ranges of motion and they just put a little pulse, a muscular pulse on top of the highly tuned elastics that they have in their body. And then you see some uh, other runners who stretch out their hamstrings. So, in other words, they're forced to run on muscle. But who's there at the uh, 23rd mile? Sure. Who's, who's coming into the home stretch? It's the elastic athlete mm -hmm. who conserved their muscles and exploited the uh, storage and recovery in their springs.
first you load the spring, then you put the pulse on it. So yeah. you load the you load the spring by either a pre motion or setting the, the the limbs into a specific stretched posture. Yeah. And I, but you have to do it quickly. So right. you, you you stretch the spring, load it, put the pulse. Well, as you start to recover, you put the pulse on. And uh, right. You know, it, it, it like take take a. Do you know what a hammer thrower is? Guys who throw the yep. metal ball on a on a chain. Yep. When you watch them wind up, so the idea is to get maximum angular velocity on the hammer, correct? Yep. Okay, well, if you just try try this, Chris, you'll, you'll know exactly what I mean. Try and wing that thing around overhead and try and get it to go faster and faster and faster. And what you'll find after you get to a certain velocity is your muscles can't move any faster. You're at terminal velocity. Now, the next time, I want you to relax. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to do now is put a pulse into the rotation on the hammer, one pulse per revolution. Yep. So you Pulse, relax, relax, pulse, relax, and you'll find that you'll wind up to a much higher terminal velocity on the hammer. Yeah. So there's just another prime example mm -hmm. of, of pulsing with the elastics to enhance uh, performance. Exercise. I know all of that. It's also the one that gets people into a lot of trouble. Yeah. So uh, I I have to start because everyone who sees me comes with a back compromise. So I start with an examination of their hips. Um, now this is very important. Uh, if you were to take what's called the Dalmatian hip, which mm -hmm. is a very much a Eastern European hip, uh, you know, Croatia up into Bulgaria, Poland, Western Russia, the Ukraine, the hips are very shallow in front, uh, which allows a deep squat. Yes. So I start with a hip exam. You've seen me do this on the assessment DVD where I place the person on their back and I scour their femur around determining the shape of the acetabulum or the, or the hip socket. Yep. Um, now, the countries I just named have a very high rate of hip dysplasia, mm -hmm. but they are also the source of the Olympic lifters. And yep. it's not happenstance. It's form and function. Mm -hmm. So that type of hip creates tremendous power coming out of the hole or the bottom of the squat. Now, let's take the archetypical anatomical antithesis, which is what I call the Scottish hip, mm -hmm. which you know what my name is. Sure. So, yeah. <laughs> So, so the Celtic Scottish hip, typically, not always, I'm just talking generalizations here, yep. tends to be a much deeper hip socket. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, you, the, 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 when I do the hip exam, the knee doesn't come right up to the chest. It actually squares across. Mm -hmm. So if I were to set up the same depth of squat, either they're going to get a bad back or they're going to damage the labrum at the front of the hip joint. So they start getting anterior hip joint pain. Mm -hmm. So do you see how you want to know what the perfect squat is, I want to know from the hip exam what, what they're capable of anatomically. Yeah. Now, the Scottish hip, I mean, there's a reason why they don't produce many Olympic lifters because you can't pull a bar off the floor. It's mm -hmm. too low. Mm -hmm. But they, they sure as hell can throw a caber. And yeah. my point is, with that type of hip, the power production is in the top half of the squat, not mm -hmm. the bottom half. Mm -hmm. So you've got, to, you've got to figure this out now. Um, also, when you do that hip exam, you're going to find the optimal knee width. And you'll find in most people, particularly with the shallower hip socket, their knees should be much wider than they uh, normally set up with. Mm -hmm. So it's the difference between, say, an Olympic pull and, and, and a power uh, a pull or, 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 or squat. Um, in any case, I work hard to get perfect alignment through the knee uh, and the ankle hinge mm -hmm. and uh, proper width through all the, those exams that I've, I've just uh, described. Then I want to see how they're going to rack the bar. So if it's a squat, I'm assuming it's a back squat with the bar across the shoulders? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Most people carry the bar far too high. And now if they're really competitive, they'll know all this. But the trick is not to carry the bar high on the traps. It's to carry them down on the rhomboids. There's a little shelf mm -hmm. that uh, nooks in there. So if I'm setting up a competitive squat, I need the bar placement down there. Now, they may not have the shoulders that allow it. Mm -hmm. um, so I might have to build 
some uh, a bit more shoulder mobility. I may have to uh, build some thoracic spine extension. Uh, mm -hmm. You've seen some of the stretch work that we do uh, mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, now we're starting to set up for, for the squat. Um, the hand width on the bar is very important. I, I know some guys advocate a suicide grip with the thumb on the same side as the fingers. I do not. Mm -hmm. I like good grip on the bar mm -hmm. because when you're getting down into the hole, I need them to grip the bar and then externally rotate to really bring in latissimus dorsi, not only as a, as a bigger spine extensor all the way down to the sacrum, but also a bigger core stiffener. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, of course, with the uh, technique, again, I need to know now their, their leg length to body length ratio and how far they have to get the hips back or forward, how vertical they can carry their body and all of these kinds of things to determine uh, how much uh, spreading of the floor, if you know what I mean by that, an external rotation through the hips yeah. that I need to, to pull. But uh, you were talking about the fellows who they've been lifting a few years now and they know how to squat. Yeah. Um, the next thing I would look for is as they're going into the depth of squat, um, I'm assuming they want to go as deep as possible yeah. just for, for, for fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I'm looking for the back break angle. Yeah. That's where does the pelvis start to pull away from the, uh, uh, the, the, the L5 vertebra or, or at the lumbosacral junction. Yeah. So um, if, if they want a competitive lift and it's a power lift and they have to, you know, say it's IPF rules, International Powerlifting Federation rules, they've got to have the top of the thigh mm -hmm. uh, parallel. Yeah. Uh, again, I, how much they're going to train that if they have a Scottish hip. Uh, I, uh, I I would really have to make a judgment call when I saw it. Mm -hmm. So some people will get away with a slight amount of flexion at the bottom. Some yeah. people, they will wear out that disc and eventually uh, get a bulge. Right. So, But remember, most people that I will be starting with will already have a bulge, and mm -hmm. yet I've got to get them back to world-class performance. Sure. So I might uh, do some hip work at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, might work more on style and bring their hips underneath. Again, I, I don't know till I saw their body type. Mm -hmm. um, I might uh, do a, a lot of corrective work just in the front squat mm -hmm. um, and not with a bar. I would take either a kettlebell uh, in a goblet squat holding on the horns out in front or yeah. I might just take a 45-pound plate hold the 45 pound plate out in front and if they're they're you know reasonably well trained hold it out at arm's length now they can squat with the body almost vertical all mm -hmm. the way down really open up the hip joints mm -hmm. and and start to develop a bit more motion uh through there i i might cue some psoas contraction to assist uh i might actually uh have them pull down in other words, they have uh, bar um, overhead cables and elastics, and they have to pull themselves down into a perfect squat position, which is another little trick yeah. um, for uh, getting them down into that perfect position, minimizing the, uh, the back break. Um, more gluteal dominance versus hamstring extension dominance is another trick yeah. uh, if they have uh, anterior uh, hip joint labrum pain. Mm -hmm. Anyway, th it's endless. As I said, if you yeah. have three hours, I can coach a squat sure. <laughs> for you. Um, and it, it's uh, anyway. That's that's the world I live in.